This is the Free Hill Life Podcast, episode number 125. I'm your host, Josh Madsen, coming at you from the Free Hill Life shop in Salt Lake City, Utah. And it's a little bit warmer this Monday. I'm sure wherever you're at, it feels like spring. It is spring. <laughs> and uh, the snow is uh, starting to mush up. Like I said last week, it's probably gone in most places where people are at. And uh, it's good for uh, those backcountry skiers that want to get out start hitting some of those bigger lines and for many of us it is another season could be something cool mountain biking hiking could be all that other fun stuff like yard work and all that good jazz let's be realistic life is uh not always full of awesomeness i mean i'd like to make it sound like that but um springtime means you got to do other uh other shit right so anyways, uh, with spring always uh, comes some fun stuff. And one of those things is this Wednesday, Telemark Colorado is doing their online streaming of Kings and Queens of the Heel. It's their video project they do every year. And you can check out the details at telemarkcolorado.com. So be sure to go there, check it out. You can find them on social media as well, Telemark Colorado to get the details about the online streaming. They just did their uh, in-person premiere in Colorado this past weekend. And uh, yeah, you don't want to miss that. They're super fun. They have a little task booklet that you can download. And then these teams make videos uh, doing all sorts of wacky Telemark stuff. So be sure to check that out uh, from Telemark Colorado. As far as us here at uh, Free Hill Life, we're just kind of getting settled in to spring and summer mode. And uh, yeah, just kind of getting in the groove. The rest of the crew came back in. Uh, we're starting uh, to get some ski kits built for the protector skis that will be available next fall. We'll have some more details, probably do a podcast on that. Like we, I, like I always say on the podcast, it's kind of been this underground thing. If you got a pair, awesome. <laughs> and uh, we didn't even have them on the website this year. So this year it's going to be a little bit different. Um, availability is going to be a little bit different. We're going to start announcing that here in the coming weeks. Uh, other than that, we're just starting to gear up for next year. That's kind of what summertime is all about. For us is getting things squared away, figure out what happened in the blur of the winter this year and start planning for next year and couldn't be more excited about that. <clears throat> kind of our last event of the year traditionally for us, and it's always kind of been a personal event, but I wanted to just kind of touch on it today because it got me thinking about just history in general and um, this uh, this event that, that I started kind of early on in... Uh, in the free heel life experience, I guess, uh, just kind of got me thinking about, uh, not only the history of the shop tradition, um, but just history of telemark in general. And I kind of wanted to just talk about that today. And, uh, <clears throat> funny enough, I, uh, I, uh, I got, I, I ate something bad <laughs> or something <laughs> and I was out. I was, a, I was, uh, ready to roll and go to the event la- yesterday and the event, I, I guess I haven't even said the name of the event. It's called the smelly knee pad. And this is, uh, an amazing little gathering that we've done every year, uh, for the past number of years. Um, I, I want to say four or five, this is probably the fifth. Um, and I, I missed it cause I got sick. I ate some bad food or something and was dying, uh, yesterday. And, uh, I just, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't make the event. So, uh, but it looked like a good time. There was a good little handful of competitors and, and they got after it, but, uh, <laughs> it was kind of funny cause I was all like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to go to this, go to the annual gathering and, and then I'm going to recap it. And that just didn't quite work out, but it did get me thinking about the tradition of it and what it kind of means to me and why I think it's important. 
So just to give you a little background on the smelly knee pad, <clears throat> this kind of started, I'll, I'll tell you the, the origin story of it. Um, like, like many things with free heel life, i I was always as a, as a young telemark skier many moons ago, I was always really inspired by snowboard culture and skate culture, even though I, I was briefly a snowboarder when I was a kid. Uh, but I mean, look, snowboard was always really cool in the nineties. There just was, it, it was radical and there was just always cool stuff going on. And I've always admired, um, at least the snowboard culture I was exposed to in Salt Lake city. And one of, one of those places was, uh, salty peaks It's a snowboard shop. I highly recommend it. If you haven't been in there literally just to walk in. And when I opened free Hill life, um, Dennis Nazari, the owner of Salty Peaks, is a collector of old snowboards as well. So when you walk into his shop, you'll realize that Free Hill Life is kind of a telemark version of Salty Peaks. Um, he's got all the old snowboards on the ceiling and uh, just you, you can tell that it's a big part of uh, how, how, how Dennis wanted to preserve snowboard at least in the visual sense, when you walk in his shop and, and that's a lot of what it is for me in, in collecting stuff too, is to make sure that there's a history, there's a something that we can see that kind of shows the evolution and, and you kind of always remember. So going back to the smelly knee pad, um, that kind of stemmed from something else that I, I had seen over the years, which was uh, the banked slalom up in, uh, up in Washington. And this was an old uh, it, Mount Baker, sorry. Uh, so Mount Baker had this bank slalom event that I read about. That's, it was a snowboard event. And I mean, th this thing dates back. I, I, I don't know when it dates back to, I want to say like the eighties or something, but what I thought was really cool about this event when I was reading some snowboard history is that what you won, if you won the bank slalom was a roll of duct tape and I remember thinking to myself, man, that's so cool. I mean, it's, it's a, yes, it's a competition, but really what it's doing is just bringing people together. And then this roll of duct tape that you're winning is, uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's the prize. <laughs> and I just thought that was so cool. Hopefully I'm getting the history right. I did not verify any of this. So I, I, I possibly could be making a myth up about snowboarding and then that's how I ended up doing the smelly. So but uh, <laughs> uh, if you're a snowboarder out there and you know any history on the bank slalom and the roll of duct tape, please verify my claims. Uh, but anyhow, it got me thinking back in uh, the 2016-2017 season, which was the second year we were open. And I'm thinking, how cool would it be if we can find a way to get a little gathering together and we we have a competition that is kind of an ode to the history of telemark, but you're not really winning anything. It's not a competition. Also like putting a competition together is sort of a nightmare in skiing, not a nightmare. I, I shouldn't say that, but having put together some comp some big mountain competitions and stuff in the past. Um, I mean, there's a lot of logistics. There's all sorts of, um, you know, planning organization, working with a resort, uh, insurance. I mean, you name it. it. It requires a lot to put on competition. So I wanted to find a way where we could sort of just show up. And it was sort of an underground competition where we had the ability to get together and do this thing. So I came up with this idea to do, uh, you, you all know, if you listen to the podcast, how much I love vintage telemark gear and how important I think it is to the existence of telemark in the modern day. So <laughs> I wanted to come up with this, this competition of sorts and gathering at the very end of the year where we kind of got together and we could show off our old leather gear. If you have it, or if you don't, we could loan you some and we would try to compete against one another for an overall performance. And at the end of it, you would win the prize of the smelly knee pad. And if you're new to telemark, you may not 
know why and why knee pads really mean anything. Um, we probably could do an entire episode on the history of knee pads, but traditionally people have worn knee pads and telemark for many years. I would say at least from, I mean, honestly, probably since the late seventies, uh, into the eighties. And I mean, there was even telemark specific, well, I guess there still are, but, um, you know, in the eighties and early nineties, you would see like companies like lifelink would make telemark knee pads. All they were, were skate knee pads. It was basically like, um, uh, a, a, a skate knee pad that you'd use for like half pipe or bowl skating back in the day. And telemarkers were, would wear them. Oftentimes people think it's because you went so low, you would hit your knee on the ski. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick insight on knee pads and why they're still relevant. Even in, in today, a lot of people think it's cause you went knee to ski and you'd smash your knee on the ski. Yeah, maybe. Um, I mean that definitely has happened. And when you're skiing on pins, on three pin bindings, your knee can hit the ski, but really knee pads are incredibly important on powder days. And so that inside knee, your uphill ski where, where you're dropping a knee, that knee is incredibly exposed to under the snow and uh, you can hit rocks or stumps or things like that. I have done it. And honestly, I wore knee pads way before I realized what, what, how they protected your knees for that. Uh, but I can attest that, uh, my, uh, kneecap probably would not be here, uh, if it weren't for wearing knee pads on a soft snow day. So anyways, there's your quick history on the knee pad, but I wanted to come up like the roll of duct tape from the Mount, uh, Mount Baker bank slalom, something that sort of represented the old of telemark. And I thought what a better thing to call it than the smelly knee pad. Cause everyone knows when you wear knee pads a lot, they smell. So kind of just gave this old sense of whatever. So, um, basically there is a smelly knee pad. It resides in free heel life. There's an actual one. It's, uh, uh, spray painted silver and sits in our shop and has a, uh, a list of winners from each year. And that's kind of what it is. So the criteria of the smelly knee pad uh, was to incentivize vintage equipment and make sure that when you showed up to compete, uh, you were you were equipped with vintage gear that was going to make it hard. And everyone has to abide by the rules of the vintage gear in order to compete. So um, I'm just going to read you the original. Uh, <laughs> this is the original, there was a Facebook group we made. Honestly, we don't really use it, uh, anymore, but it does have the original rules in it and I'm going to read them to you. So this is actually what it says. Hi boy or high wrestler at Alta six pack entry fee, which I don't really know if any of us actually showed up with a six pack to get into this thing, but that's apparently what we were trying to do at the beginning. No rules. Overall impression judged by three judges, each scoring on a scale of 10. Skis cannot be over 70 millimeters underfoot and must be 200 centimeters or more in length. All bindings must be pre-G3 Targa, in other words, 1997 or earlier. Leather boots only. Plastic cuffs are acceptable. Merrill super comps, et cetera. No plastic boots. The winner gets their name engraved for eternity on the smelly knee pad. <laughs> so that's kind of what we came up with was sort of this rule set where 200 plus skis, uh, 70 underfoot and leather boots. And you can definitely go, uh, Plastic Cuff, Merrill Super Comp, if you're familiar with that boot, late 80s, early 90s, basically any boot leading up to the Scarpa Terminator that came out in 1993 or 92. Sorry, I'm missing my dates. But you get the idea. And uh, <laughs> we picked High Rustler uh, 
which is if you're not from Utah and you don't know this area at Alta, it's basically like the peak you see when you get to Alta and you look up and there's just this this peak off to Looker's left of the main runs coming down to the Collins lift and there's just a a really prominent line that comes down. Generally, it's full of moguls by that time of year and generally it's a little bit dicey getting into it. Now, I will say one of the, one of the hardest parts about uh, one of the hardest parts about getting to the smelly knee pad or uh, one of the hardest parts of the smelly knee pad is getting to the smelly knee pad. So if you've never skied Alta before, one of the things you're going to get to know is that uh, there's a lot of traversing and there's one very famous traverse called the high traverse or the high T. And if you really want to get a sense of telemarking and vintage gear, one of the most difficult things that you would probably never think of because we kind of take it for granted now is your ability to traverse for long distances across incredibly bumpy terrain on skinny skis where you need to edge on a steep slope. And when you're talking 70 millimeters underfoot, you have to think the binding toe is wider than the skis. So the more that you go to edge and angulate into a traverse, the more likely it is that your binding is going to hit the snow and kick you out and probably make you go sliding. And that uh, that sort of is the hilarious part of getting across the high traverse is just the fact that traversing is incredibly difficult. <laughs> so uh, it, it's sort of a rite of passage. Also, if you're on leather boots, and here's another funny thing that I think people don't think about is being on a set of leather boots. Now, it, uh, it, it can be difficult. And if you don't have a higher cuff, so if you're in a boot that's reinforced leather, like in a solo extreme or something along those lines, you have to remember it's still pretty low. And that upper cuff that's sort of set like a Merrill Super Comp, like I mentioned, it makes that fore and aft a little bit more sturdy. When you're in a low cuff leather boot, I mean, you're talking about it's landing below your calf. And so when you're going across a traverse and you get bumped up and down, uh, it's, it's tricky because you might get bumped and actually there's not really a back seat when you have those low cuff leather boots. So you got to be kind of careful. Um, really, it, you know, one of the funny things about that is telemark stance is actually the safety zone, in my opinion, when you're on low cuff leather boots. So when you're just traversing in a parallel on low cuff leathers, um, safety zone is telemark position because it gives you a bit, a better base to stand on, um, as you're going across those bumps. So kind of a, a true, uh, a true need for the telemark stance in, in, in that regard. Um, but anyways, that's, uh, you know, get, getting to the smelly knee pad. Uh, it's, it's a little bit difficult. Um, we have done it in other areas over the, over the years. Uh, and really because we, we kind of set it on a, on a specific date and we just go for it. And honestly, sometimes the snow is not quite, um, warm enough. Um, so you're talking about like, you know, uh, bus sized bumps that are ice and, we're there to have fun. So we usually try to make sure, you know, if it doesn't work out to go there, it's probably somewhere around there where the judges can see, you know, try to put some rocks in there, a little jumps, you know, for those that so desire to get so radical on their, um, pins and leather. Um, but yeah, so great times. And that just went down this past, uh, Saturday and, uh, incredibly important event and tradition for the free hill life crew and those that want to participate and just to kind of give a, a shout out to the winners this year uh the top three so the winner well actually let's go from third to first right that's probably the best way so in third place elliot gore uh backcountry banana boy and uh good friend of the shop and he's participated in several of these and always is a top competitor. In the second position, a familiar face to the smelly knee pad and probably, 
I think the all time winner, uh, he, uh, I did beat this gentleman one time, but there is some discrepancy as to whether or not I actually beat him. That is Taylor Johnson, AKA Telly Tay. He took second place this past Saturday at the smelly knee pad. And this year's winner of the smelly knee pad, a newcomer to the top spot who will have his name engraved on the smelly knee pad forever and ever and ever at the free Hill life shop. So when he's old and gray, he can walk in and say, Hey kids, that's me on the smelly knee pad back in 2022 i rocked it and this guy is very deserving because he literally was out there skiing leathers so much this year everybody kind of knew he was going to crush everybody nick hoffman hoff dog awesome energy and a super fun guy to watch telemark ski so congratulations nick hoffman and the rest of the competitors at the smelly knee pad it's awesome to see what you guys accomplished and i'm so sorry i couldn't watch it in person but i am i am sifting through the photos and videos and trying to recapture uh (laughs) what what went down but uh sounded like it was a great time and really appreciate all these young folks carrying on a tradition that i think is incredibly important so Really why I feel like traditions are so important and I and I wanted to hit on this today because obviously the smelly just happened gets me thinking and gets me thinking about why things like that maybe are important to me, maybe why I always think about history and telemark history. And you know, I've always I've always had this uh sort of need to or or interest I should say in telemark history. And it's always been something that I've gravitated to. Um, But it's not always something that, um, even though I gravitated to it, it also is something that at certain points earlier on in doing stuff with Telemark, I think I kind of fought against it. And it kind of got me thinking when I was thinking about the smelly knee pad and I was like, oh, that's so interesting to think back. You know, some of these, these guys that are competing What's so important to me is, you know, these guys are in their, you know, early twenties and they're out there skiing on leather gear, vintage equipment. And, you know, I can, I can see a lot of people are probably like, well, what's the big deal? Like, why is that important? Or, or maybe it's, it's just this novelty, you know, to go ski old equipment. And you're seeing a lot of that in skiing too, you know, like, you know, springtime people are pulling the onesies out. People are pulling, you know, the old school skis or, or the, the retro, uh, you know, outerwear, um, everything's fluorescent, you know, people are rocking their pit vipers and, and it looks like the 1980s. Right. And I can see that there's maybe a sense that people might look at this and be like springtime fun. And, uh, you know, you're pulling out the retro gear and I totally get that. And I think a hundred percent, that's a part of it. We're out there having a good time, but I also think there's an incredibly important historical part of this and it's part of why I think it's really important. Um, so I kind of, I you know, when I started putting this podcast together, I, I was like, you know, I should look up a couple quotes about history. And uh, I wanted to just share these quotes because it, it, it kind of hits on the point that I, I wanted to try and make. Uh, the first one's from Jorge Santayana says, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And the second ones, we learn from history that we learn nothing from history. George Bernard Shaw. And I just, you know, this is the kind of stuff I think about with with the history of Telemark. And kind of this point that I wanted to put out, like I just said, there was points where I started doing Telemark stuff more in the business sense. And I think this is probably like early 2000s when I was a sponsored athlete. I'm in my early 20s, mid 20s. And honestly, it was, it's funny, even though I've always gravitated to the history, there was sort of a stretch of time in the early 2000s where a lot of us younger people were trying to sort of um, fight against the history. And, and what I mean is, if you look back to that era, like early 2000s, there was kind of this sense that everybody thought telemark skiers were hippies. And you still hear that today. 
you know, not as much. I mean, it was a real thing, right? Like in the early 2000s, there was sort of this culture around um, sort of kind of telemark trying to fight against being perceived as a hippie sport. And, you know, K2 Telemark was doing a good job. I mean, you literally had a, uh, you had skis like hippie stinks, you know, um, but it was like, you know, it's like a twin tip, you know, uh, you know, it was basically a Seth Morrison Alpine model that had a Telemark top sheet on it, you know? Um, so there was kind of this, like, let's go the opposite way from tradition and let's try to kind of reface this whole thing and make it look not like maybe it did in the past. And I'm a hundred percent guilty of that. You know, like I think, you know, there's sort, there was sort of this young, you know, a lot of us were starting to ski in the terrain park. Um, a lot of us were trying to go faster and go bigger. And there was, there was this whole progression of, you know, what can be done and how do we push into the future of telemark? How do we make it look and feel like something that isn't what it once was. And I get it. But I think what I've learned over the years is there's sort of a sense of where progress sort of starts to erode the history of where something came from. And in doing so and moving forward and trying to progress I think that sometimes, not always, but in many times we end up doing damage through the progress in terms of what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to achieve something new and better, but we kind of forget the roots of it all. And I think that that, that can often be damaging. So the, the first thing I thought of, like when I read that uh, George Bernard Shaw uh quote, we learn from history that we learn nothing from history. (laughs) I thought about myself, what I just explained, you know, I think there's sort of this sense, especially when you're young, right? Because you're trying to break molds. You're trying to be your, your own person. Again, I'm speaking for myself, but I I can see looking back specifically uh, in my life, you know, you're trying to like break the mold and do this thing. And I think that's really important to do. But, you know, it took me many, many, many years to sort of go back to understanding uh, the where the roots can be important and where the roots can be improved upon. And uh, I think about, uh, you know, I, I was talking about the early 2000s. I think about a movie I put out in 2010 called Hippies, Punks, and Misfits. And I've mentioned this before, but the reason of that title was because when I was doing these movie tours back then, you know, I mean, we're talking super DIY. I'm going to like town to town to town. I would usually do like 50 shows in like 90 days. I'm going town to town with a projection system and a PA. I'm like in my Subaru later. I think that that year I was in my van and the latter half of it. But the point being is I started realizing, you know, here I show up, I'm kind of like this punk rock dude. I'm meeting sort of all the hippies that are coming to the telly thing. I mean, I kind of threw the misfit thing in there just to sort of categorize the rest of the folks that showed up that maybe had a misfit attitude. I don't know. I mean, um, I've always felt like there's sort of a personality uh, that fits telemark or generally speaking, when you get talking to folks, we have this common bond of things that we like, uh, but it's... uh, we might not look the same, you know? And I always thought that was so cool to experience that in real time where, you know, we all really loved telemark skiing. And honestly, if, if we taught, I'd go to these shows and I started realizing this as I start, started going to more and more events around the country and even in Europe and you, you sit down and, and you're just passionate about learning how to telemark ski. And there was always this common bond around the turn, how you learned it, your story, your experience, and just being able to come together like in a, in a matter of moments, you know? And I still see that today doing the podcast. People reach out. I'd say more times than not, people reach out 
and they're like, hey, thanks for doing the podcast. Here's my story. And I love that. So if you ever want to send your story, I want to hear it, you know, because I love that. And I feel like that's what bonds us together. And uh, so anyways, the, the reason I called it hippies, punks and misfits was because of this sort of commonality that we all had. And I think it was probably around that time I started going, wow, this is crazy. You know, here I just spent the last five or so years of, of, of my telemark career or whatever you want to call it basically being a a glorified ski bum. And, uh, you know, I distinctly remember sitting in meetings where I'm like the graphics of the skis, like we got to go more radical. We got to do this, you know? And, uh, I think it's just, uh, you know, it was a young man's brain. And even though I loved the history, I was trying to break away from the history. And I think there's, there's a need to maintain both and maintain a balance. And honestly, once I latched onto that, I've always felt like that has always been a more successful recipe of progress is to maintain a certain level of the history and also try to progress forward. And to me, you know, it is being able to learn from history. So I know I'm kind of talking in in general terms and maybe a, a more personal experience, but one of the other things that I'm starting to see and part of what got me thinking about this was gear and where we're at with equipment right now. And it's, it's interesting to me, um, some of the stuff that we're, that's happening in equipment right now. And if you listen to, uh, the podcast that Taylor and Taylor and I did this, uh, the death, death, I can't even speak. Sorry. The death of 75 millimeter. We were talking about, you know, a lot of these companies coming out and saying, Hey, we're not going to make 75 millimeter telemark boots anymore. You know, what does that mean? And we, and we talked through it. Well, one of the things Taylor and I talked about was the opportunity that it presents to fill some of the gaps that are happening or will happen that we're seeing in telemark in terms of bindings and boots. So What this got me to start thinking about was the history of boots. And there was one moment in particular in a podcast that I was doing with John Faulkner, another great episode, total legend. And he was talking about testing the first Terminator boot, first plastic boot. And he was talking about how the flex of the sole wasn't even and how you know, this is like night, this is like the late eighties, early 90, you know, 1990. And it, you're coming from leather and you're getting this, this certain type of flex. And here we, here they were trying to make this new plastic boot. And I think this is a good illustration in the gear realm of things where progress was maybe was trying to mimic history, but it wasn't taking into account enough history to make the progress correct, if that makes sense. So I, I've thought about this a lot too, because the leather thing to the plastic, I, you know, it's, it's really easy to say, oh man, those old leather guys, they just don't want to move on. You know, you know, they just, they're total Luddites. You know, if they just moved to plastic, their life would be better, better. But I started thinking about it because now we're in a a similar conundrum with bindings, right? Like you have people coming from a plastic boot and like a G3 Targa and they're skiing a a setup from like the mid 2000s, that era I was talking about a little while ago. And now they're going into something that's like not a cable binding, NTN, different flexes, different uh, pivot points. And in some ways, I think we're in a similar situation where it's easy to dismiss the people that because their gear is old, we tend to not give it any credit in terms of new gear that we need to create because we're like, well, we need to progress forward. You guys need to get off this stuff. And so it was kind of these two, thinking about the the situation now, thinking about this that that little thing that John Faulkner said to me and then thinking about history in general, it just really opened my mind. 
and I started thinking about how we can, um, yes, we need to progress the gear, but are we trying to progress it in the, in the right ways for the people, you know? And with Telemark, I think some of the things that we're probably going to see in equipment is no matter how much we quote unquote progress into the future, you know, a boot needs to flex evenly, you know? Um, and no matter how much we try to progress forward, bindings need to have options. Nowadays, I think the progress really comes in. Can we make bindings that have multiple types of features for flex and pivot point? So I think there's just so many opportunities that are available to us moving forward. And, um, it just, the, the smelly knee pad, I guess it just kind of got me thinking about the importance of history and why we need to look backward in order to progress forward in a way that's meaningful. And I think that's a really important thing. And whether we're talking about gear or culture or whatever, I think it's really important to know our roots and kind of know where we came from. So thanks for listening to my little rant on uh, history <laughs> and uh, why I think it's important. So definitely uh, definitely gave me some clarification about maybe why, why that's important. So anyways, let me know your thoughts. Shoot me an email, podcast at freelife.com. What are your thoughts on maintaining the history in telemark you know i think i'll probably get a pretty wide array of thoughts on this cuz a lot of people are still in this actually people i think newer people especially they get in to telemark and they're like wow you guys like why are you showing this old stuff it's so dumb and it kind of goes to this point i'm making is if you don't know where it came from you you're you probably get in and and sort of think yeah, why, why you need to market this differently or whatever. So anyways, I guess you see maybe, you know, where, where my business is, like I try to always sort of point backwards and point forwards at the same time. And, uh, I think that's an, an important thing, at least from my perspective, you may or may not agree. And that's cool. But, uh, I do think that's an important part of how, how I've seen it and how I've experienced it. And maybe, maybe today kind of gives you uh, a little insight into why I think that's so important. So I guess just to, to wrap up, definitely, uh, uh, would love for you to stay in touch with us over the summer. Uh, the mailing list, always a great way to do it. Link is in the show notes and how you can support us shop at freehilllife.com. Check it out. You can still reach us at customer service at freehilllife.com. And like I said, I would love to hear your thoughts on this episode and you can reach me at podcast at freehealthlife.com. Also, I'm always looking for mailbag episodes, questions about telemark skiing. Maybe we'll, uh, if you're in the Southern hemisphere and you listen to this, I would love to find out more about what's going on down there. Keep me in the loop. I try to try to keep tabs on what's happening all over the world, but obviously I, I have my limits. So please keep me Keep me uh, in the know. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Uh, take a second to rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts if that's the platform you're listening on. Otherwise, I hope you have a fantastic week, a fantastic Monday. And until next week, spread telemark always, my friends. See you later.